see everybody back again and uh, we're going to continue right on with our line of teaching that we've got more or less on the blackboard and that is that everything coming out of the Old Testament is looking forward to the wrath, the vexation, the tribulation, the second coming, and the kingdom. And uh, we just ended up in our last program where Peter is quoting from the prophet Joel and Peter had no idea of anything any different than that, but that after the uh, period of time of, uh, well, Psalms calls it a time of, uh, oh, confusion and so forth, and then would come the tribulation, and then the second coming. All right, now we're just going to keep on going on these Jewish writings, and uh, I'm going to skip all the way across Paul for first, and then I'll go back and show how Paul alludes to it. But come all the way now to the little book of James, which we're really supposed to be studying verse by verse, but we haven't gotten there yet. That'll come a little later. But uh, if you'll come back with me now to the book of James, and uh, I lost it. I just had it. But James says the same thing, that everything was getting them ready for this coming of the wrath and vexation and the coming kingdom. Goodness sakes, I lost it. And uh, here it is. In uh, James chapter 5. Good thing I got a patient audience. James chapter 5. Oh, that's right. We were, going to, uh, we were going to introduce some special people today. Goodness sakes. Uh, while you're looking for James chapter 5, we're going to still do it. Over here on the front row with the reddish hair and the glasses, we get letter after letter asking, is that pretty lady on the front row with the reddish hair and the glasses, is that your daughter? No, this is Sharon Martin. She's not our daughter. We love her like one because she works with Jerry Poole and uh, is also doing all the closed captioning. So uh, Sharon is in, intricately involved with the work of the ministry and her husband is sitting right over there next to her, of course, uh, Andy Martin. And then uh, today of all days we've got all four of my family people with me, or four of them I should say. And uh, number one, we're going to put the camera on my daughter Laura, who many of you talked to uh, over the phone. She answers a good portion of them. We got some help now, so she's not all alone. So we have my daughter, Laura. Next to her is her husband, Jerry. And uh, then next to Jerry is his niece, or Tara's cousin. And her name is Randy Thomas. And then in the red, we've got Tara. That's Jerry and Laura's daughter and uh, my precious granddaughter. I think everybody knows uh, how much I love Tara. She's our oldest. She's our first. And uh, so anyway, those are the four over there. They're family. And everybody, of course, one degree or another is involved in the ministry. And even Randy, once in a while, will come in and help package and so forth. Hadn't lately. She's got another job. But Randy has even come in at times and helped out. And uh, we're just tickled to death that they're here today. So, did you get them all on this time? We hope so. Okay, now then let's go back and pick up where we were just pointed out in James chapter 5 and get your thoughts back in line. All of these writers are talking about the end of the ages and the coming in of the wrath and then the kingdom. Even James, all right? Chapter 5 and, uh, oh, let's see. Verse 8. James chapter 5, verse 8, Be ye also patient. Now remember, James is writing to Jews in that period of time, right after Pentecost. And he says, Be patient, uh, or be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is 2,000 years away. <laughs> is that what it says? No, it's what? It's nigh. It's nigh. They thought he would be coming within a matter of a short period of time. All right, let's go over and see how Peter puts it in uh, his first epistle, and that's in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. All with me? 
Now, I, again, I have to go by the wishes of our television audience. We get letters that either appreciate the fact that we take time, or if we don't, they'll say, take a little more time so I can find it in my Bible. So, bear with me. We try to keep all these things in mind. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. And Peter now, according to the times that I've got here on the board, is writing probably uh, in the late 50s or somewhere in that neck of the woods. But, he says, the end of all things is what? At hand. See? He's not talking about something 2,000 years down the road. Peter says the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be sober and watch and so on and so forth. All right, now that in 2 Peter, he doesn't make quite that strong a statement, but he's certainly looking by... Uh, uh, all the way to the end of the kingdom and on into eternity, so we won't stop at that one. But now in the little first letter of John, 1 John, which I, according to my time frame on the, on the board, I'm putting it right along with the rest of the Jewish writings, the Gospels and, and James and uh, Peter, and now look what John said. Verse 18 of 1 John 2 little children. And remember, he too is writing to Jewish believers. Little children. It is the what? The last time. See? We're at the end of time. It is the last time, and as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come. My, what's he referring to? The tribulation. It's just over the horizon. And even now there are many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the what? The last time. He's not thinking in terms of another 2,000 years. It's just over the hill. And you can pick it up even again, uh, oh, in chapter 5. I think it is. No, chapter 3. I'm sorry. Chapter 3. Chapter 3, and you can just start at verse 1, because even though these things are appropriate for us, and you've heard me use these verses, yet in their original intent, they were looking at a near-term end of all things. All right, so as John writes, like I said, I think in the late 50s, not 90, like most of your Bibles put it, although if that's what you want to believe, that's fine, you know, that won't upset your plan of salvation or anything like that. But I feel that John writes at the same time as all these other writers. Look what he says. Chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Now that's appropriate. We're in the same situation. All right, now verse 2. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Well, what's he talking about? The soon coming of Christ. See? He's not talking in terms of 2,000 years out into the future. All right, then, of course, it's obvious, it's obvious that the book of Revelation is talking about the end of all things. But all right, now, like I said, I want you to see how Paul alludes to some of this. It's certainly not a big thing with Paul. He only talks this prophetic program in a few verses in 2 Thessalonians. It's the only place in all of Paul's writings that he makes any allusion to this end time scenario of the tribulation and the second coming and so forth. All right, 2 Thessalonians. And I just better start at verse 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Sorry, honey, I didn't give you the chapter. Chapter 2, verse 3. All got it? Now, Paul says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, that is, the day of the Lord, spoken of in verse 2, which is the tribulation, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day cannot come, except there come a falling away or a departure first, and that man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition, which, of course, we understand as the Antichrist. 
And then he describes the Antichrist in perfect accord with Daniel and Revelation, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all is called God, or that is worshipped, or that he is God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, and so on and so forth. All right, now then the other point I wanted to make before we move on any more in all of this is how that even the Apostle Paul honestly thought that everything would be consummated in his lifetime. He thought the Lord would rapture the believers out and that in would come the tribulation and then in seven years Christ would return and set up the kingdom. All right, now come back with me then to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And all I want you to watch are the pronouns. How that the Apostle Paul is including himself in a near-term event. He's not saying concerning them, but he's concerning us. All right? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. Now that's a word that Paul uses over and over. We had a class the other night on just the mysteries. Two hours. And my, as the people filed out, they said, that's the best class we've had in years. Well, it's just simply because, again, even though they've heard it over and over and over, it never gets old. How that to the Apostle Paul were revealed these secrets that had been kept in the mind of God, and now they're for our understanding. Now, here's one of them. This is just one of many. Behold, I show you a mystery, a secret. We. Now, I'm emphasizing it for a reason. He's including himself. We shall not all die physically, but we shall all be changed. What's Paul expecting in his lifetime? See? And so he says, we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and so on and so forth. All right, now then let's come on over to the other portion where he speaks of this sudden departure of believers, and that's in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4. And again, all I want you to see in these series of verses is how he is including himself in this sudden departure of believers. All right? Verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 4. He said, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Oh, how about the church today? That's what they are. They are just totally in the dark about all this. And the scripture pleads, don't be ignorant of this. Understand it. All right, so he says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them who are asleep or who have died physically, that you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. Now look at the pronouns again. For if we, including himself, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, which is Paul's gospel, even so them who have died in Jesus, God will bring with him. In other words, from their place in his presence down to the atmosphere to be reunited with their resurrected body. All right? Verse 15, For this we say unto you by the, way of the, way of the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain. Have you ever seen that before? That we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have died. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now verse 17, watch how he includes himself. Then we who are alive and remain, are still living in the flesh, see, shall be caught up. And remember I've told you in past programs, the Latin Vulgate word here is raptured. And we shall be raptured, or as we in the English call it, raptured. And so we shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the earth, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? 
when I'm telling you that everything in Scripture is expecting these last days to all be fulfilled in a matter of 10 or 20 years? Now remember, Paul is talking in this term in here. Christ has ascended. Tribulation hasn't begun yet. But Peter and the eleven are preaching in Jerusalem to the nation of Israel. And Paul has now begun a ministry to the Gentiles. And we'll put that timeline on on the next program, not this one. But all I want you to see for now is that all of Scripture seemingly is telling us that all of this would happen within a matter of a few years after his crucifixion. No hint, no hint, with one or two exceptions. And I guess I could take the time to show you. There's just one real exception, and I've had a few of my listeners, and one of them is just a miracle to me. She's only come out of a dead religion within the last nine months. And the other day she wrote and asked about these series of verses. So I'm going to take you back to them. And how she found it, I'll never know. Maybe I alluded to it once someplace in the past, but I don't remember it. But go back to Hosea. Hosea, which is right after the book of Daniel. And other than this, I don't know a thing in the Old Testament or in the Gospels that refer whatsoever to what we call the church age. Come back to Hosea. It is right after Daniel. Hosea chapter 5, the last verse, and the first two verses of chapter 6. But you know, it's funny that almost no one in the biblical scenario in Israel or anyplace else ever alluded to these three verses. And yet I think it is a hint. All right, Hosea chapter 5, verse 15. Got it? Okay, and I think this is the Lord speaking. I will go, in other words, from heaven to earth. I will go and return to my place, which of course he did when he ascended back to the Father. And he will stay in his place until, there's your time mill. So I will go and return to my place until they, which of course is a reference to the nation of Israel, until they acknowledge their offense, which was their rejecting the Messiah, and seek my face. And one day they will. In their affliction, which of course is a reference to the tribulation, in their affliction they will seek me early. Now then drop down into chapter 6, and you have Israel responding. Come, let us return unto the Lord. For he hath torn, in other words, he has chastised them, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, but he will bind us up, which will happen at his second coming. Now chapter, uh, yeah, chapter 6, verse 2. After two days, now here's one of those instances you can take a day in Scripture is how long? A thousand years. So after two thousand years, He will revive us. And we're seeing the beginning of that in the Middle East right now. Israel is back in the land. They're once again a nation. And one of these days, the whole end time scenario is going to kick back in gear. So here was an indication that it would be 2,000 year interval. But other than that, you can't find anything in Scripture. All right, so read on, verse 2. After two, year, two days, or I think 2,000 years, He will revive us. He will bring them back to the land. And in the third day, which is the kingdom now, remember, the next 1,000 years, in the third day, He will raise us up and we shall live in His sight. Pretty plain, isn't it? Pretty plain. But other than that, I can't find anything in all of Scripture that speaks of this end time scenario as being 2,000 years out into the future. All right, back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Our time is going fast, I reckon. Oh, we've got a few minutes left. Okay. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17 now where Paul again uses the pronoun we. Then we 
who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord near. So shall we ever be with the Lord. So comfort one another these words. Now drop into chapter 5. And if this doesn't clearly depict a, a pre-tribulation outcalling, I don't know what does. This is as plain as you can get it that the church will be gone before the wrath and vexation begins, chapter 5. But, Paul says, of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. In other words, he's not going to set dates. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, that's the tribulation now, remember. Did I lose? Have you got? Did you get it, honey? First Thessalonians 5, now verse 2. Sometimes I forget to give her a chapter and verse, you know, and she sits over there helpless. Okay, for verse 2, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now watch the pronouns. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. Not us. See that? Them. Well, who are the them? Those who've been left behind. The unbelieving world, see? And so then sudden destruction cometh upon them, the horrors of the tribulation, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. You see the difference in the pronouns, what that can do? All the others, he's including himself. He thinks it's going to happen within his lifetime. But he makes it so plain that only one group are going to be taken out and the rest are going to be left for the horrors of the tribulation. All right, now then I have to show you how that both Paul and Peter do not realize that they're going to go through the valley of the shadow of death. They're not going to see the return of Christ in their lifetime, but instead are going to have their life taken. All right, I'm going to take Peter first. And we'll have to go to 2 Peter. Second Peter, chapter 1, and verse 14. Now, you remember last program when I delineated these various writings. I don't know if it comes out clear or not. But after the prison epistles of Paul, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, and that took place between 64 and 66 while he was in his first imprisonment, remember, and then he was out for a short period of time, and then he was brought back into prison the second time, during which he writes 2 Timothy, and I think within the same time frame, Peter also writes his second little epistle, several years after I had him writing 1 Peter over here with this list of Jewish writings. All right, so after the prison epistles, including 1 Timothy, now, a couple of years later, Paul is back in prison, and he is going to be writing 2 Timothy, which I showed in the last program, will finish the New Testament. But look what 2 Peter writes at about the same time. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 14. Knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, in other words, the body of flesh, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Now, you remember when that was? You remember at the miracle of the fishes? When the Lord told him, Peter, feed my lambs. And then the Lord told him that he would suffer a martyr's death in veiled language. But I think Peter forgot all about it during his years of activity. But then as he gets to the year 68, he realizes that his life is going to be taken. And so he writes, I know that shortly I must put off this, my tabernacle, this body of flesh, even as our Lord Jesus Christ 
showed me. All right, now at the same time, I think almost, and I'm going to say within a matter of a few days or months at the most, look what Paul writes now in the last book of our New Testament. And that would be 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And what a difference in language. Up until 2 Timothy, Paul wrote as if he was going to be here at the end. He's going to be here for the rapture. In would come the tribulation. Christ would return and the kingdom would be set up. And the last days would all be fulfilled in a matter of 10 or 20 years. But now you see, by Holy Spirit inspiration, he lets us know that he realizes that he's not going to see it. All right? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Now, do you see how plain that is? Suddenly, the apostle realized he's not going to get out of prison this time, that he's going to be martyred, he's going to suffer execution, and of course we know that he did within a matter of days or weeks after writing uh, 2 Timothy, then uh, he was, we think, according to uh, most church tradition, he was executed by beheading. So now 2 Timothy then, I think, can rightfully be called, as I showed in the last program, the last book that was written of our New Testament that finished everything that God wanted the human race to know for the next 2,000 years. And uh, all the rest of these books that were written earlier were with the idea that it would all be fulfilled in short order. That's why they were all lumped together in this period of time between Pentecost and, uh, what have I got, 58 A.D.? because it was all looking forward to the culmination of everything before they got an idea that it wasn't going to happen. God is not going to bring in the tribulation, and instead He's opening it up for 2,000 years of grace. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick.